Well, this is sure fun to start seeing everybody here today. Since you guys are the, we have one minute to spare, I guess we better, can you guys hear me? Great. Hi, Caitlin, not Caitlin, Eliza. Your, your, your name got me. It's good to see Al, uh, Pierre, I'm so glad you're here. Dave, Dave, you're muted, just so you know. Pierre, you're muted, just so you know, but you've got a minute before you have to completely unmute. It's good to see Dr. Um, Tang. I, I think I'm good to go. Good morning, okay. good afternoon. Okay. Yeah, wherever you may be, this is great. Oh, it's the top of the hour. I think we're just going to go ahead and get started. Boy, I just want to start saying everybody's names because I see so many neat friends here on. And I'm really excited to see some people on the other side of the world. I see you, Tom who's named Julie. Good to see you. I I did. A, if you saw your emails, everybody, I made a big mistake. I forgot about daylight savings over in the UK. So Adele O'Toole texted me. She's giving a talk right now. She's going to hoof it over and she'll be on time, I think. But I'm going to talk first anyway. So I hope you guys just all know we're humans. We're doing our best, but we make mistakes. And I made a daylight savings mistake. So Good to see lots of names here of you guys showing up from across the world. And without further ado, because we have a full agenda today, I'm going to just go ahead and get started. I'm going to share my screen. And I just love you guys. It's so nice to see everybody here today. You can tell if you're new, we're pretty, we're pretty casual, but welcome to the town hall. And um, just give you a little agenda of what we're doing. I am, if you don't know me, I'm Jana Schwartz. I'm the executive director of PC Project. And I'm going to give an update on uh, just a few things about PC Project. And then we'll have our question and answer session with our experts. And I'll, and I'll introduce them in a minute. First of all, I just wanted to tell everybody, um, this is an update. But if you really want to stay informed, whoops. Got to go back. Do you really want to? I'm trying to get my my Zoom thing out of the way. If you really want to stay informed, I just want to encourage everybody to know to go to our website. We've got a fabulous news and events section on our website, and you can also explore the website for more information. Of course, we have our newsletter and social media. And I know a lot of you are not on social media, and it's no problem at all. But I just wanted to show you that. Um, that let me that we do some fun things and i just wanted to do a quick shout out for our social media campaign for rare disease day last month we did a big campaign and we even did a, a an instagram and a facebook live i've got kara who does our facebook and and our our social media graphics and she's young so she gets me to talk on social media which is always scary but again that is on if you're not on facebook and instagram you can go see that and I was really impressed with people that month and even the month before who did our Valentine campaign. And, and this is just a small sampling of some of you who put out your PC Valentines. And I just wanted to point that out to tell this group, you know, we have spent so much of our lives hiding the fact that we have PC and including me lying about why we limp or what's wrong with us. And I just want to give a shout out to all of you patients, all of you community members. We're getting out there. We're doing it. And um, thanks for sharing your stories. Aren't they, don't you just want to cure all these people right here? So thanks for spreading the word. I always struggle when we have town halls and virtual meetings, what to tell people because we have newbies who are brand new to PC Project, who have just gotten a diagnosis. And then we have some of you who have been with us for years. I just wanted to tell you quickly, our vision has not changed. And we help people all over the world and of all races, all nationalities, genders, everybody. So just know we're here for you. Our mission hasn't changed. We've got so many questions. I'm going to just skip this. Just wanted to remind you all, the main thing you wonder, what in the world does PC Project do? Some patient advocacy organizations only do research. Some patient, some organizations only do patient support. We do it all. And we do it through these two powerful programs, our International PC Consortium of Researchers, Physicians, and Industry, that's pharma people, and of course, our registry. And the registry consists of people like you. And I just wanted to 
remind everybody it was funny. I was talking to my husband the other day and he goes, you know, you talk about the registry all the time. And for someone like me, a registry is just, you know, you write your name on something. But no, a registry is when you guys are part of the registry, there's a whole process of things that we do at PC Project. But there's even more. Once you're part of the registry, you're part of our our group. We There's just so many interactions and things that we do to keep a registry and to keep us all coordinated. I'm going to skip it because I just want to, I'm not going to spend much time here except there it is. I just want you guys to know that even though we talk about it all the time, it's just a huge process and it's a huge amount of resources, time, but it's what makes PC Project so strong. And it's why you're all here today. We are growing. I always have to say this, especially if there's people from pharma here, we continue to grow. And I want to just point out this very cool Power BI chart that's on our data page of our website. You can see it. You can get on here and you can click on like K6A and you can see all the genes that are in K6A. Why is that important? Well, even one of the last research conferences we were at, we had two scientists that were talking about gene therapy and gene editing. And guess what? They were all over our web page pointing these things out, saying, how can this be done? So we have to know who our patients are. We have to get genetically tested. We cannot find out what we have without it. So thanks to all of you who are in the registry. I'm going fast because I've seen the questions and I want to get to our experts. A lot of you want to know about clinical trials and studies. This is just a brief list of and it's not detailed at all about what's happening in our disease space. We've got Kamari Pharma, Solgel. They both have been doing phase one clinical trials. We've got Biomendix and Aptiva. They are also um, biotech companies that are exploring possibilities for PC. And we are also looking doing some studies with off-label treatments. So that is quick. And some of you might not have heard based on the questions, but I think most everybody knows the Palvella clinical trial, phase three trial, unfortunately failed last summer. And I'll be honest, I spent a day of ugly crying, maybe even a weekend. It was very disappointing, but um, we just pick up our bootstraps and we move on and we, we mourn for a minute and we moved right on. So I just want to let this group know, all of you, we still have things. We still have things going. There's still possibilities. The only way we can get something approved is if we participate in clinical trials and do this process. So on we go. And we'll talk more about in detail some of these things in a minute with our experts. So again, these are our, our, these are our big things. I got to go back to the consortium again. We empower research, again, through the International Registry. Publications continue to come out. We've got several in the process right now. We're actually working with another group on a textbook, if you can believe that, and another one that wants to do a PC images project. So it just keeps coming. Because of you, we were able to award almost $400,000 in PC-specific research projects. And if you want to know specifically what we fund, it's right on the website and we'll do more this year too. And we continue to collaborate with our consortium all the time, all year round. But you've been seeing this probably in our newsletters or our social media posts. We are getting ready for our big PC consortium symposium of researchers and physicians who are interested in PC. You notice this little tag on my screen. We're putting it with the international, excuse me, not the international, the Society for Investigative Dermatology Research and their annual meeting. It was our consortium that said, have your meetings with these guys. Again, we're a charity. We're cheap. We want to save money. And so if people are already going to these big meetings, we're going to hold our big meetings there. I just wanted to tell you, why are we doing these? Why do we do symposiums? Well, first of all, they're a scientific meeting for researchers and physicians who present and discuss findings that apply to PC. They get there, they collaborate, they share ideas and learn from each other. And truthfully, guys, we energize, we hope, the existing PC scientists and we win the hearts of the new ones. Again, we're rare. 
And if we don't get their attention and get them to think about us, nobody will. And I just wanted to show you this little logo. This is our logo for our for our meeting this this year in May. And we're so excited because you think about the people that are in the consortium, these scientists who and these doctors, some of them are on this call today. I, we don't mind being fluffy and saying we are driven by love because people on this call, even today, our experts are doing this for free. They give so much to us, their time, their talents, their their expertise. And, and I don't know why else they would do it, except they're just the best people in the world. At the same time, we say we're guided by science and um, we are not completely fluffy. We are we are science based. And that's what those things are. And just a little teaser, June Awareness Month is coming up. So all of you, I hope you will be thinking of what you can do for June Awareness Month. But we are going to do a T-shirt for a fundraiser that month. And we're going to use this as the logo. So I hope you guys like it because it not just sums up the consortium, but it really sums up PC Project. I just wanted to do a quick shout out to Kamari Pharma. They are going to be a sponsor, one of our sponsors. I said the other sponsors, PC Project, of the 20th IPCC Symposium in Dallas. And Kamari Pharma is one of these companies that is working to do something for PC. So I just wanted to say thank you very much, Kamari, for your support of PC Patients. In June, we're going to head on. You know, I talk about we're going to this big conference in May and where we're going to have our big consortium meeting, and that is all skin research. But there is a newer conference that's rare for rare skin disease, and we're going to go to that this year. We've got three abstracts from PC Project that were accepted, and I just wanted to thank um, Dave and Adele, and I don't know if she's on here, but our resident medical student, Ashley Whitmer, who also has PC, and she has really driven a lot of our projects. So very excited about that. Last announcement. We've got our patient support meeting coming up in Europe. And I just want to tell, especially all you European patients, yay, our very last patient support meeting in Europe was in 2018. And you know, we typically go every other year, covid mandated that we cancel our 2021 and just and then we had some virtual ones but here we are we're back and all of the information is up on the website you can read it carefully i wanted to say a huge thank you to jenny hart she is on our um she's a pc or she's been to some meetings but she also happens to be an event planner and she has worked so many hours to scout to to find things to work with the hotel and get us a fabulous, amazing arrangement. So take a look at the website, see what you think on that. Again, why Libsyn wasn't on my bucket list, but again, right after our patient support meeting, there is a big meeting. It's called the European Society for Dermatology Research. It's going to be there. Again, the doctors and scientists are already coming there. We'll participate there. We'll exhibit. We've got a session. We've got some of our patients who are going to speak there. So we're very excited about that. So again, there we go. Patient support meeting, Lisbon. That's why we're going. If you have any questions about the PC side of thing or PC project side of things, feel free to put them in the chat. But without, without further ado, let's get to the part where I think all of you guys want to be. We're going to get really casual here and, but, and answer your questions. We've got so many submitted. And um, I just want to introduce our experts. We've got Adele O'Toole. She's a professor of molecular dermatology, and she is in London. Dave Hansen from the University of Utah. Yes, I am so lucky, blessed that I have my own physician, but he is right here in the University of Utah School of Medicine. He is also the PI of our registry. So if you have um, received your diagnosis through us, good chance Dave has looked at your case. And um, actually, a lot of these people have to. Joyce Tang, so happy to have Joyce here. She is a professor of dermatology and in pediatrics, and she's at Stanford. And last but not least, we have Pierre Colomb, and he is with the Department of Cell and Developmental Biology from the University of Michigan School of Medicine. And um, he, I just have to tell you, I've always said, I, not just because she's famous now, but I said even years ago, the fact that these doctors are talking to us and on our team, it, it's like having Taylor Swift on our team. 
it's just absolutely amazing to have these kinds of people. So have I talked enough? Let's get done. I'm going to quit sharing. And I've got a whole lineup. We got Dave, Pierre, Joyce, Adele, you made it. I told them at the very beginning, Adele O'Toole, Professor O'Toole, she had to speak at another thing and she hooked it over here quickly because I messed up the UK daylight savings time. So, okay. So experts, are you ready to rock and roll? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so very first question. I want to know if there is any cure. Joyce, are you on? She said she could take that question. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be happy to. Thank you again you so much. So fast. Right, like, happy we're to yeah, thank you, Joyce. Um, so currently, as you already uh, <laughs> um, mentioned, there's no cure for PC, but there are so many people are working so hard on the project to find the cure. So with so many projects and, and potential treatment in the pipeline, I'm very hopeful one of these days we will find a cure for PC. Thank you, Joyce. And I hope all our experts, maybe I should have given them a chance to say hi. Does everybody want to say hi real quick? Joyce, you said hi. Go ahead, everybody. Hi, we're here. Hi. Okay. Hi, this is Pierre. I just um, thank you, Joyce, for uh, for taking that first question. I just want to add something to it. In terms of a cure, we, we know the genetic defects, so we know uh, what needs to happen for a cure to take place. In this particular case, the problem is how to make that happen in a way that is effective and safe and so forth. And, but there's a whole slew of uh, treatment options that are uh, being entertained that yet to be discovered that address the symptoms. And that could be also very effective as part of PC management. That's not a cure per se, but it could help alleviate the pain, the discomfort, the, 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 the aesthetics of the lesions and so forth. And so that's uh, also another realm of, of, uh, of research that needs to be amplified um over, over you know over the next few years thanks Pierre and you know it kind of helped me answer the question why do we need treatments first why don't we go directly to a cure and that question is for me well for anybody and but you kind of said it a little bit but go for it yeah it looks like Dave's ready to say something too go ahead well I mean I, I will say that the skin is a the skin is a barrier um, and um, in terms of a cure, it would be nice if we could sort of correct the genetic defect in our skin cells that are responsible for, uh, you know, that carry the mutation that are ultimately responsible for the disease. Uh, so the skin being a barrier, it's very difficult to get at the right group of cells. The other complication is that this, the skin is a tissue that renews itself all the time. So you have to go to the source and change the genome of the cells that are ultimately responsible for the beautiful property of the skin to be a tissue that renews itself constantly at a high rate, like the bone marrow and like uh, uh, GI tract and so forth. So these are inherent difficulties to targeting these cells uh, with reagents that would be safe in switching back the, the genes and the genome to what it should be. I hope this helps. Sort of a corollary to that uh, here would be that the we we know what the the mutant keratins the the, the genes create a keratin and the the question I have is how does that impact the callus formation how does it impact pain there's a cascade of events that's taking place on the cellular level that if we don't cure the gene perhaps we can stop that cascade like we do with inflammatory diseases like psoriasis or eczema can we break that up and so that's something else in in focus in terms of research we could. We can alleviate the symptoms without changing the genetics. Yeah. 
there are uh, several more questions that, that are coming on the list. I know that we're going to talk about the clinical characteristics in more detail regarding whether it's a cyst, or whether it's a pain, whether it's a, you know other um, specifics. And uh, the, the challenge for PC is that uh, the clinical manifestations are so different from each individual. There are a lot of a heterogeneity to the disease itself, but also there are some common characteristics, for instance, the pain, the itch, the burning, and then making people really difficult to, uh, to participate in uh, regular acti their daily activities. And that's really impactful uh, for, for, uh, for those that are affected to, for this, uh, by this uh, condition. And therefore, you know, there's a uh, there are definitely priorities, you know, what we need to address, you know, some of these uh, common clinical manifestations that there are others, but they're symptomatic relief. You know, we're absolutely trying to get to the root of this disease and, and work on a, a, um, a treatment, hopefully at least <laughs> close to, to a cure and mitigate the symptoms as much as possible. Perfect. Thank you. I'm, I know I'm looking at these questions going, how many did we just get answered? Let's go to one down here. It says, um, there's plenty of drugs for conditions like psoriasis. Is there any chance some of them what might work for PC? And Joyce, you indicated you might be able to answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll answer part of it. Uh, there, there's so so many <laughs> experts in the room. I'm sure that uh, you know we all have our own perspectives. But I can de definitely start first for psoriasis. So psoriasis is considered as a um, a multifactorial. Uh, disease. There is a genetic predisposition, but we know that the um, most of the symptoms are caused by some common inflammatory pathways. And therefore, once we know what are the inflammation or what are, what are the pathways that, that got turned on, uh, and there are these new therapies and that are being developed. And I just want to make it clear that many of these are uh, treatments are clustered together because they're developed at different phase. And initially, for years, there was only, there were only one or two treatments, right? Over the years, as people study the inflammation, they get to know the underlying cause of these inflammation better and better and newer drug that came out to, to be safer and more effective. So these took uh, decades and many years and they they came out in, in fa different phases. They all, you know, not all at once. And this is the same thing we're trying to do for, for PC, for rare disease as well. And, and, you know, the different part is that uh, for PC is we know the specific gene that caused this disease is a monogenetic disorder. And then what happened afterwards and were manifestations is like a branching out of all these different clinical symptoms. So that's why making the management is so difficult. So for PC, it's going to be a slightly different strategy and we're going to get back to the root as, as close as possible. Thank you. Hey, next question. I'm just going right down the list for our experts. Adele, I'm going to send this one to you. I have just started using erlotinib. Now, erlotinib, if you've, if you've been on any of these calls or some of our patient meetings, you've heard this. It's a, it's a other treatment, but they want to know how others have been doing with this drug, with PC. Adele, do you want to take that one? Yeah. Uh, so certainly there are, there are about eight patients reported in case reports that have been treated with oral erlotinib. And erlotinib basically targets the epidermal growth factor receptor. And it's a treatment that's used in some types of cancer. Uh, but in the dose used in, in PC, it's used at a, a lower dose. So in cancer, it's used at about 150 to 200 a day in PC and also in a, a keratoderma, which is quite like PC, painful calcis, Armstead syndrome, it's used at lower doses of 50 to 100 uh, a day. 
So I have experience of putting a couple of patients on Erlochna. One was a gentleman with Armstead who was in his 60s. And uh, he, his feet improved, you know, dramatically straight away. Within 24 hours, he said his pain was gone. And he had been in pain day and night for, for the first 63 year, years of his life. So that was quite remarkable. And now he's taking 100 milligrams three times a week and maybe increases a little bit a bit bit in the summer but in general uh, about three times a week and I started a patient with PC on it fairly recently uh, and he felt that there was that there was an improvement uh, pretty, pretty much within a couple of days. Um, I also know of other other patients so Alan Havnanian in Paris has treated three patients which he's reported on uh, and he showed actually very nicely in a paper, you know, some of the pathways that are activated in PC. So we know that the epidermal growth factor pathway is activated. We know that the mTOR pathway is activated, which was targeted in the Palvella trial. And we know that TRIPV3 is activated. Um, and TRIPV3 is the gene which is mutated in Armstead, but it also seems to be important in PC. And it seems to interact a bit with the epidermal growth factor receptors. So that's probably part of the reason why erlotinib uh, seems to help. However, erlotinib has got quite a big side effect profile. Um, so certainly in my opinion, I wouldn't advise somebody with mild to, to moderate PC to have it. I would probably say it's probably for the, the severe end of the spectrum. And there are two companies that I know of, well, actually possibly three, who are developing topical or lotnip as a treatment. So uh, that might be something for the future as well for patients with PC. Thank you, Adele. Joyce, did you have, were you raising your hand? Oh, no, no, no. Okay. <laughs> I was just okay. moving so out of the way, but I, I can... Uh, I can tell you that I have also a patient, uh, Janice, you are aware on, on Erlotinib as well. Um, and I have uh, actually a younger patient who recently started. I take a slightly different approach. I started with the lower dose of Erlotinib um, because sometimes it can give people uh, pretty um, significant skin reaction, especially acne form eruption. Most of the people don't think about it acne as much of a problem compared to their PC. But <laughs> let me tell you that we have seen uh, in being in the tertiary care center, you know, we do have other patients taking a lot number for other condition and their their um, acne can get worse. So, you know, I start a severe patient on a relatively lower dose of 50 milligrams and then gradually increase it as they, their body get used to it. And we can, uh, in, you know, just balance the bent the efficacy and side effects. Thank you. Perfect. And thank you. Um, I noticed that Dr. O'Toole is keeping up with the chat, which is fabulous. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Somebody's got to do that. Who knows what they're talking about? That's great. Okay, let's keep moving on then. This is this is exciting that there's some possibilities out there. This is really nice. Um, wanted to ask, is there a future for IA, AI, excuse me, artificial intelligence to assist with the research being done for PC? Could AI accelerate the knowledge with siRNAs, CRISPR studies, et cetera? That's a loaded question. <laughs> um, I mean, I can start first. Others uh, feel free to oh. charm in. Uh, at this stage, I don't think we're quite there yet. And, and, and CRISPR is uh, certainly a very promising technology that used for gene editing, for instance, if we're thinking about doing correction and targeting uh, the the disease and uh, from a gene therapy standpoint and and uh, but uh, at this point, you know that we're not quite there yet. And, but and uh, you know AI, in, is a tool we think of it as a more supportive, uh, you know, augment and the way that uh, we do conduct a research, the way we take care of patients. So, uh, um, AI, on the other hand, have been used quite successfully in recent years in terms of imaging analysis and, and um, 
and acquisition and to standardize and because uh, uh, you know we all on uh, it, the disease itself um, varies from time to time and uh, um, and investigators when they looking assess uh, photographs even even though we're taking pictures and sometimes the way that we analyze it looking at pictures and it could be there could be some inconsistency so there is definitely a, a road to perhaps to some of these lower hanging fruit um, but not quite in uh, in the uh, more advanced research and uh, arena yet. Thank you, Pierre. And, yeah, um, I think Joyce, thank you so much. Uh, you're hitting it uh, on the nail. I mean, I'm I'm a a, a basic researcher. I've been studying the uh, so-called PC genes, stress response keratin genes, K6, K16, K17 for. Uh, more than I care to admit. If I engage AI about these genes and these proteins, it, it, it's going to do what AI can do. It can, it can summarize what's known out there in ways that the human mind cannot. It's an incredibly powerful platform. But AI does not think. And AI, it needs to be guided in order to be helpful. So you, we, the experts, whether it's patients, uh, physicians who treat PC, or people who research uh, PC from the standpoint of biology and pathophysiology, have to query AI the right way in order to get insight, as uh, George says, not solution, but insight that can help us get there. Very powerful platform, but um, it's a support tool, like uh, Joyce said. Perfect. Thank you. Moving on, maybe Dave and Adele will get to you. What types of research needs to be done before we can get to a cure or even a good treatment? Well, actually, Joyce and Pierre would probably be good at that, too. What What do we need to what more do we need to know? Do we know everything about PC or what what's left to know? Why are we still doing research? Dave, do you want to take that? Well, descriptively, we know a lot about PC. We know where the gene is. We know where the gene looks like, where it is on the chromosome and so forth. And we know the uh, the effect. We know the, the what they call the clinical clinical characteristics, the phenotype, uh, the calluses, the pain, the, the leukokeratosis and so forth. But what I would like to know is the pathway in between. How do these mutant keratins affect the pain and affect inflammation and affect callus formation. And so there's some pathways in there and they sort of alluded to this with, with psoriasis. We, we know about interleukins, uh, about uh, small molecules that, that carry inflammation that we can block. And if we knew a little bit more about how we get from the, the keratin to the, the, the phenotype to the, the calluses and so forth, I think we could do some things to interrupt that pathway. And I think that's what elotinib is doing is that uh, the epidermal growth factor is involved in that pathway. And so that's an example of what we could possibly do to, to increase uh, treatment effectiveness is to understand more about how that gets there. Thank you. Adele, yes. <laughs> we also uh, still don't know a lot, I think, at the cellular uh, level, like what's happening in all the cells in the nails, what's happening in all the cells in the cysts, what's the turnover of the calluses in PC. So for example, at the moment, some of the topical trials, they're only treating patients for three or four months. Maybe that's not long enough. Maybe you need to treat a lot longer than that. Uh, so there's still a lot of, 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 of information to be, to, to, to be learned. We also need to learn about uh, you know, more more detail, I guess, about the type of pain, what, what's happening to the nerves and blood vessels and the callus. Um, and there are various techniques, types of transcriptomics where you look at single cells and uh, where they're oriented in the space. So where they are in the callus, where they are in the blood vessel or, or, or the nerves, etc. Uh, and can get quite a lot of detailed information from that. So there is quite a lot of research to be done but as somebody who does research you know there's always research to be done so you know you do some research and that creates a new question so you don't ever come to the end of doing re research re research just goes on and on and on right. i'm so yeah, grateful that we have people like you doing it 
Go there are some questions. Take... Some questions in the chat about steatocysts, and we've talked about cysts. I think that Dr. O'Toole has done some work uh, on that aspect of PC, and uh, maybe it isn't updated, Della, what you know and what's happening. Yeah, so I'm 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 still doing some work. So I'm I'm do, doing something called spatial transcriptomics, where we basically take a slice of of a cyst. So we've taken early cysts, we've taken more advanced cysts, we've taken the cyst wall, we've taken the skin above the cyst, and we're trying to look in detail at the genes within the cells uh, to try and identify what pathways are sort of starting the whole thing off. Um, um, what causes the development of a cyst? Well, it's obviously related in, you know, PCK17 to the mutation in Kirk Garrison 17, but what pathways are involved? That's fantastic. That's a perfect example of the fact that we always think about PC and, well, well not always, but we think about PC and the painful calluses and skin on the feet. But truly, those cysts are very debilitating for our K-17 patients. And I know our K-6Bs and our K-6As get them as well. Not as severely as the K-17s, but they can be horrible. I mean, when you get a cyst that's just inflamed and hurts, it can it can overwhelm a patient. So we're just thrilled that that is a piece of PC that that that, that Dr. O'Toole is, is focusing on. So thrilled for that. Um. It just, it just, no, anybody can jump in, yeah. 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 Now, there was also some questions about hidradenitis, which is an unrelated, but produces some similar changes to some K-17 PC patients. There's been uh, some treatment suggested for hidradenitis. Uh, talk about any experience you've had with that uh, condition and, and uh, if it works for PC. That was for Adele. Oh, <laughs> Basically, uh, yeah. we want to know. So, if, yeah. So basically, a survey was done, I think, by Elise Wrecker's group of the PPC project patients. And I think 25% of them self-reported hydradenitis type symptoms. So hydradenitis superativa is a condition where you basically have boils under the arms, in the groin area, sometimes on the bottom, uh, sometimes under the breasts. Um, and you can get... Uh, sort of comedones and, and scarring. Um, and basically 40% of patients with PCK17 reported they that they had what sounded like hydrogenitis. Uh, and 25%, I think, of all the PC patients, so all uh, subtypes reported hydrogenitis-like uh, symptoms. So certainly I find for some patients who have quite a lot of inflammation with their cysts, that sometimes a course of antibiotics is helpful. I don't particularly find that uh, isotretinone or acetretin help. So those are drugs derived from vitamin A, which are used for acne and are sometimes used for carotiderma as well. Um, a further uh, drug that's used in hydradenitis is adalimumab, which is a drug that's used for psoriasis. It's a monotonal antibody that targets TNF-alpha. So I haven't actually treated a patient with uh, PCK17 who has inflamed steatosystomas with adalimumab. But I think there are a couple of case reports, and I would say that, you know, it was like a little bit, you know, there wasn't a major improvement. There might have been a little bit of an improvement. Right. Striking so, success. Yeah. yeah, so that might have answered the question, the best way are there treatments to help these cysts? You know, we get these young kids, they reach puberty and, you know, they really struggle with a cyst once that happens. So just, I think you answered that. I mean, so, at the moment, uh, it's mainly surgical options, actually. Right. Yeah. Joyce? Yeah, I just want to charm in a little bit from the clinical aspect as well. So these assists, you know, we, um, uh, PC patients are certainly prone to have this particular type of assist, but sometimes, you know, incidentally, 
we also uh, excise a uh, larger cyst from HS patients and who have uh, similar pathological findings as well. So there are indeed quite a bit of an overlap between the, uh, the two conditions. And, uh, you know, like any disease, and uh, when there's, uh, when it's, a con uh, it's more advanced and uh, there are all, there are always more clinical symptoms to be managing the pain, the drainage, the, the inflammation. Um, but um, as the disease advances, the treatment and uh, algorithm perhaps a little different. So the way that we're thinking about this is that um, it probably started with the keratinopathy, the plugging, and then the inflammation kicks in, and then the bacteria that loves these um, sebaceous materials start to overproliferate. Then the signal amplifies, and so our approach to these type of assist, you know, when they're small, certainly it can be removed, and uh, some of the more conservative treatment, drainage injection was a uh, was the anti inflammatory is cantaloc can can work and when it's more advanced you see more redness the inflammation and drainage then we need to step up thinking about some of these medical therapy whether it's a um, uh, TNF alpha inhibitors or antibiotics and then surgical approach. I do quite a number of a surgery and can always be used as uh, adjunctive treatment. So if you do have a, a surgeon, someone that's a close by that know how to do HS surgery, it can be quite helpful for uh, 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 NOMA as well. And uh, there are a couple of uh, different uh, surgical uh, approach that used for this, aside from a drainage injection. And if it, you know, for a man, especially if they have a hair on the chest, a hair uh, uh, laser, sometimes it can be uh, somewhat helpful. Uh, it's not gonna take away all the symptoms, but um, um, additional specific techniques uh, can be, uh, quite useful uh, for this condition. So find a surgeon who's a, who's a, who's experienced with these type of a technique in, uh, in your area. Thank you. And since we're talking about things that hurt, pain management is a big deal for I think all of us with PC. And um, what advancements or strategies are being explored in the field of pain management? specifically tailored for PC, what would you recommend for pain? Dave, do you want to take that? Well, let me just or... let me start with that because there was a question about lidocaine and, and, well, and can lidocaine be used and so forth. Lidocaine is, is effective for numbing the skin. It basically blocks nerves. And so it, there's some temporary uh, improvement, but it doesn't last very long and it's not a good long-term solution. So if you had something that was painful, you wanted to, to, you know, to block that pain for a short period of time, then lidocaine can be helpful. But long-term, repeatedly using lidocaine, first of all, there's some systemic concerns about toxicity, and, and then it's just not a good long-term solution. So that it's a, it's a good short-term blocker, but not a long-term solution for pain. Okay. And while we're at it, what about ibuprofen? Why does it, why is it the ibuprofen helps but not say Tylenol. Does anybody want to take that? Adele? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think ibuprofen probably helps because it's anti-inflammatory. Mm -hmm. So it reduces inflammation. And we know that, that there is inflammation in, in PC from the work of Pierre and, and, and others. Okay, Pierre, were you gonna make a comment there? No, Adele, Adele said it all. Did it beautiful, yeah. great. <laughs> There, there are some precautions that do, and I do want to mention, especially since the PC is a chronic disease, if people do take a high dose for a long period of time, and oftentimes you, you know, others have experience as well, um, uh, for older folks, especially if they have a kidney insufficiency, you do have to, to take a precaution because the nephrologist and the kidney doctors will tell you that you need to cut down your, cut back your dose and think about the alternative or multimodal approach to the pain. So is there a substitute for ibuprofen? Well, as a corollary, the, the GI effects of ibuprofen can also be a, yeah. be a concern. It can affect the stomach lining. 
um, bleeding can occur and so forth. The, there's a subset of what are called COX uh, inhibitors um, that have a little different mechanism and may be easier on the stomach, but have the same long-term concerns as ibuprofen. Okay. That's the always that's always the trick for PC, isn't it? Because it is a long-term thing. And I was just gonna add, when you do take ibuprofen, take it with food. Is that correct to our doctors here? Take it with yes. food. Yes. Always take yes. it with food. Good. I don't know if this is a question that would well, maybe I mean, this is basically Jan, all all non-steroidals have those problems. You know, if you take them right. in high dose, you're going to get gastric irritation. Right. Uh, and in older people, or you know, if you're on drugs for let's say hypertension or other things, you can get drug interactions that can cause kidney problems. So, you know, you have to be, be a bit cautious about long long term use. Be and very also careful. For older folks uh, who are on warfarin and blood thinner already at uh, risk of bruising, bleeding, and taking ibuprofen can certainly increase their risk. Fabulous. Not fabulous, but yes, good to know. <laughs> Always good to know. And I think we, we might have touched this already, pain management methods and options that do not include opioids. Well, we know we got ibuprofen and anti-inflammatories. What other things would you suggest if you, you know, do you want to stay away from opioids? What would you choose? So... Some patients I, I know have had success with, with drugs that target neuropathic pain. So there are drugs like uh, amitriptyline, for example, which is, a, is an antidepressant. When it's used at, at a low dose long-term can help take the edge off, I would say, the pain. It won't take mm -hmm. away the pain, but it might help the pain a little bit. The same applies for uh, gabapentin and pregabalin, uh, which are two drugs that are... Um, Gabapentin is, is a drug that's you, you use most commonly for epilepsy, but it's also used for for pain and uh pregabalin is as well is used for pain. Um I have some patients who also use something called versatus patches, which are uh little patches that have uh light lignocaine in them. And I don't encourage them to use them, you know all over their feet, but if they have like one callus that's particularly painful, they cut it out and put the versatus patch on. And that nice. just helps, helps them get through the day basically. Right, thank you. And I would encourage you all to also remember that we have a tips and tricks section of our website where people, patients have shared ideas. It's such a great resource. So don't forget that we have that. Boy, I want to I want to jump now to I want to go back to clinical trials and research again. Is that okay? I'm 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 flipping back and forth to our experts a little bit. Um, can you give us an overview? Maybe this well of any upcoming clinical trials or research initiatives that we should be aware of. And is there any requirement for us to participate in future at some of these upcoming clinical trials? Adele, this might be you might be the most connected to some of these. Um. So, yeah. Sorry, I was trying to answer something in the chat, which I've had. I know you're doing I've so great. I answered. I haven't done a very good job. I'll go back to it again. Um, no, you're totally fine. That's great. Yeah, so, so I'm involved in a trial of um, a TRIP V3 inhibitor. So TRP V3 basically seems to be important in pain and skin. It's mutated in Olmstead syndrome. It's also up-regulated in PC. And there's a company in Israel called Kamari Pharma who have a phase 1B trial of uh, TRIP V3 in, in PC and Punctic PPK. Um, and basically, there's been a, a three-month cohort, and now there's going to be a four-month cohort starting uh, sometime soon in the next month or so. Nice. Um, other trials I'm aware of, uh, I mean, I know there's some interest in topical erlotinib in PC. I'm not, not aware of any company definitely deciding they're definitely going to do a trial in the very near future. Do, do, do you know, Joyce? Uh, 
No, people are, are using it because it's over the counter available in the United States, a company wow. pharmacy. And, uh, but I'm not aware of any official trial mm -hmm. that are ready to launch. And, uh, you know, that, that's another really important point uh, that brings up to the, um, especially for topical therapy. And sometimes it's a very, uh, not very easy in a certain part of the world. <laughs> it's a, a little easier to get access than the others. And, but meanwhile, you know, in order for all the PC patients to have access to these treatments, it's really important to, uh, you know, to start to some of these clinical trials so we have uh, objective and uh, scientific measures of whether, you know, a drug is safe and uh, how efficacious it is. Perfect. So, I see there another one for a... Botox. Mm -hmm. and in, uh, I don't, I'm not aware about Botox in the chat. I'm not about uh, aware about Botox trial. This the, For a very similar reason we just alluded to, because the Botox is uh, also relatively easier to get to. Botox is an interesting drug. It is, um, it, you know, it's in the U.S. Uh, approved for hyperhidrosis. So many PC patients do have increased sweating on their feet, which cause uh, additional skin fragility and that blisters in pain, and especially in the summer when there are seasonal changes. So Botox can really help to alleviate uh, symptoms oftentimes, but it is very painful to inject for you know, uh, one foot, it, it probably will need to more than 55, 60 injection points. So it's not that easy to do uh, in clinic and, and it's a hard. To, um, and, but on the other hand, the Botox does modulate over time, can modulate uh, inflammation to a certain extent. And, and so we use it for for other area as well, other conditions. And so it modulates the inflammation a little bit and it modulates it, uh, the pain uh, to a certain extent. And so there's a problem, there's a definitely a role in clinical use, but it conducting a clinical trial at this point uh, due to the access is uh, a little hard. Thank you, Dave. There was also just a corollary that someone asked you about whether if you participate in the Pabella trail, are you still eligible for future trials? And the answer is obviously yes. That doesn't uh, disqualify you in any way. So that if there's trials that you're interested in and are available, that that would not disqualify you from participating. Thanks for letting us know about that, Dave. We will always let you know about trials as well. Adele. Uh, I would say an exception to that might be if, a, a different company developed a new formulation of topical serolimus or topical rapamycin. They probably wouldn't want the people who had had topical rapamycin or serolimus before to, to participate. Okay. But right now, everything that we know of that's coming is not the same, right? Is that correct? Mm -hmm. right. Okay. Great. I'm going to go back. Maybe Pierre, you can, I'm skipping around a little bit on this paper because we're, we're adjusting. And um, I just wanted to ask maybe Pierre, do you know anything that's happening with siRNA, CRISPR, any kind of the gene therapy research that's, do you know anything that's happening for us in that space? And you're muted just so you know. Thank you. Uh, yes and no. I mean, I do know about uh, these efforts. I think when it comes to these targeting strategies, and now we're talking about strategies that are really have the potential to be cures because you can change, uh, you know, do away with the mutation in the in the uh, causative gene. Uh, the problem that we're having is one of delivery. Um, how to get to the right cells so that uh, the uh, delivery and also proof of safety in that the, the molecular surgery that you do in the, in the genome, you know, in, in, in our DNA is absolutely specific for uh, the defective gene, in our case, the PC keratins, and, and not, not nowhere else in the genome. 
that it, it does not leave anything behind that could be a complication over time, but also um, that you are getting to the cells that are ultimately responsible for the ability of the skin to renew itself at a high rate, the stem cells. So these are the major roadblocks uh, that we're facing um, at this point in time. And I, I cannot say, and I mean, I'll defer to Adele and Joyce and Dave, or you, uh, Janice, to, to, to comment on whether there's you're aware of efforts that uh, should give us uh, uh, sort of uh, encouragement in the short term. There are definitely companies that are working on delivery system currently to figure out, uh, you know, uh, uh, how to how to get the treatment to, to the right place. Um, as a doc uh, Dr. Colum just just mentioned, um, and this is dovetailing, I'll probably answer two other questions in, uh, previously submitted uh, regarding gene therapy that currently developed uh, for other rare diseases, especially epidermolysis and bullosa that got a lot of uh, media attention regarding their uh, the two gene therapy. You know, one got approved and one is uh, pending for approval in the next two months. And um, EB is a little different disease. And so when you, uh, the first therapy was that was developed and, and, and it can be used on open wound, open skin. So there's not that barrier and you can, you can apply the gene therapy directly on open wound and uh, make this and lay down the collagen that's deficient and, and help with the wound healing. And the second approach is to uh, replace the, the area of the skin and uh, um, remove the top layer completely and then stitch in a piece of a skin graft and, and that's genetically corrected. Neither of these type of a delivery system in the short run, at least to, that we see it's a feasible for PC. Um, so we have to be creative and whether using different type of a vehicle or using using um, a, another surgical assisted to delivering uh, system, uh, for instance, uh, you know, laser and other technology to assist the delivery is this something that are being actively investigated. Thank you. And I don't know how well this contributes to the conversation, but um, in our, you noticed that one of the grants that we funded just recently is a gene editing grant. It's, it's work that's being done. It's very basic science work, but it is being done. So again, you can go to our website and look at that grant. You can see where it says grants awarded and you can see what PC Project has funded just recently to, to start getting this. I, I noticed in the chat, I'm not following the chat very well. I'm so glad, Adele, that you are handling that. Thank you very much. You're doing a great job. Um, retro therapy. I don't know who you are, but make sure you contact me. I hope you've got my email and let's let's talk. I'm not sure this is this is new to me. I hope our scientists are reading that a little bit. I'm not sure this is you guys catching that. People who are smarter than me ask, Acidian just got IND approved by the FDA to replace exons 1 through 22 of the Stargates gene. Only five years of follow-up is required versus 15 years for CRISPR. We have RNA transplacing molecule that can rewrite K6A that we want to partner to help test. Yeah, I need to learn more about the, the science. Yes. And to, again, you know, it's not just about gene correction and to how to do it and how to deliver it is really the key and how to localize it. Okay. Just make sure you contact me because I have access to all these experts. They're, they're fabulous. So please, please let us know about that. What else? Let's see. What do we, where do we got? Um, I think we did the trial updates. I think we're good. I'm just making sure, Dave, are you looking at the questions? What are we missing? I think we've done well. We're doing really well. Um, one person asked about pain in winter. 
And they said, I live in Nigeria and it's not always cold here, but sunny. My legs get inflamed and sore during harmattan season. I had to look that up to see what that was. It's dry and windy season. Although the pain is across the years, I just want to know if pain increases during the winter. Now, that's a question probably for the PC group out here. If your pain, I think traditionally, most people in our community hate the heat. We don't like hot. In fact, I have a son that would go and he would pull up a chair and put his feet in the freezer when his feet hurt a lot. So a lot of patients don't like hot. However, I have met some patients, I think they were K-16, in fact, I know they are, that very much did not like the winter. So Dave, do you want to comment on that? I, I think it's variable, you know, and exactly what you said, majority things seem to be aggravated by by you know, hot, dry heat. And if they have to walk when they're, you know, when it's hot outside, it bothers their feet. But there's a subset that do fine with warmer weather, but but don't like the cold. I don't know if we've ever looked at to the differences, whether it's uh, a different uh, gene, uh, whatever that does it, but there's certainly, it, as it goes both ways. There's no perfect solution. Okay. Most of them find it's helpful to put ice on their feet when they're, when they're painful. Right, right. Yeah. This is, this is why I, I'm saying that the PC is, is so complicated because there's so many elements early on we talked about, uh, you know, how do you get uh, um, the disease from a one gene mutation, su such a specific mutation and get to all these downstream problems. So it's really the, the, the clinical manifestation that, uh, you know, when the when it, here, uh, when the weather <laughs> gets warm, most of the people have tend to have a little more inflammation. I think that's probably why. And uh, the cooler weather, and it helps with the, inf the inflammatory component. However, for others that have a lot of uh, vascular abnormalities uh, associated with their disease, the vasoconstriction and with the cold, cold weather can really get to them. And the, the nerve travels with the blood vessel. So we call it the neurovascular bundle. Many of you, when you shave down your, your callus and you see that black dots, the black dots are not just the blood vessel, they're nerve ending in, as well. So what, what when you have vasculopathy, I expect the, um, the weather change, the temperature change can really affect their, uh, their, their sensitivity. Thank you. So I got to ask this. Well, we've been asked and I always ask, I get asked it a lot. Why do the calluses grow on the feet? We know there's a genetic mutation. Why are those calluses growing? Maybe Dave and Pierre, do you want to answer that? I'm, I'm, go ahead, Dave. No, I'll just say oh. that usually calluses uh, with friction or with injury to the bottom of the foot. Uh, uh, and it seems like, for instance, runners, if there's places where you're rubbing, the skin's response to that is that it, um, it thickens to try and protect itself. And so in my mind, a similar mechanism is happening uh, that when, when you, with PC, the, the skin's trying to produce excess callus to protect itself because of the injury so that these uh, keratins don't, don't make uh, good skin. They don't have the nice structure that skin should have. It breaks down and the skin responds to that by thickening to try and protect itself. Yeah, Thank I'll, I'll yeah. add that, yeah. So, so uh, stress, mechanical stress, mm -hmm. um, of which there's multiple modalities. I mean, one might say compressive stress is, is a trigger for uh, mechanically responsive gene expression programs. These keratins that are mutated in PC are stress responsive keratins. And in my lab now we're studying how they respond to mechanical cues. So I think that mechanical cues is part of the answer that uh, uh, to the question that Jan has framed, why calluses and why do they grow? Why do they grow over time? is related them in part to the character of these certain genes mutated in PC as being stress responsive. So it's like you enter a vicious circle, you experience stress, you turn on the stress keratins, including the mutant keratin, 
Expression of the mutant keratin is uh, it causes functional defects that are perceived by the cell and the tissue as stress. So then stress keratins come into play, including the mutant keratins driven to higher levels. So if you look at a, a PC lesion, and we have so little information about this because the biopsy material is so precious and it's so it's a rare disease. But the biopsy material, if you look at uh, what's in there, the stress keratins in general, including the keratin that's mutated, are way, way high, reflecting a, a, a wound that does not resolve a situation that does not resolve. So it's a cycle. And in that sense, it has uh, similarities with psoriasis. And that's why some of the same pathways are involved in both. But why is it that in PC, it, it is specific to PC? Uh, uh, we would love to know that so much. More research is needed. Thank you. What great explanations. Really appreciate that. Oh man, our time, uh, our time is up. We have just... Do we have time for two more questions or should we just call it a day? Maybe, how about this, just with one last question. If we didn't get to your question, um, if you're listening, we didn't get your question, ask it, keep, well, we've got so many good things going in the group chat, which is great. Thank you, Adele O'Toole for answering that. Really appreciate that. Um, but you can always ask us and we have our group chat on Facebook. There's a lot of answers that go, especially if they're just from patient to patient. Get on that group chat and ask your questions. I just wanted to ask this, maybe this group at the end with the increasing awareness and advocacy surrounding PC, what steps can we as patients do to enhance, to help your work? I'm changing the question a little bit. What can we as patients do to help you, to help keep this work moving forward. Do you have any suggestions for us? Continue to uh, raise awareness and, and uh, uh, we can always use help in, in any kind. And uh, you never know which a scientist and, and as you mentioned, Janice, have a brilliant idea or, or, or others who, who can help in different ways. And so continue to raise awareness and participate in clinical trials and, and uh, be involved to update with, uh, with your own profile registry and provide as much uh, clinical information as possible, especially with all the other, you know, uh, treatment and therapy that people are currently using off label uh, you know, your your own experience and, and put that together. Um, and so collectively, we can learn a lot from these case, case, series, case trials. And so all of those can be helpful. Thank you. Um, Adele. Yeah, I think, I think that patient advocacy and patient group advocacy actually is incredibly important. Because the people who shout the most get the most. That certainly happens in the UK. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and and for, for example, I mean, I know that, you know, obviously that disorders that affect the brain or that disorders that are fatal in babies are, are more serious than PC. But uh, at the same time, you know, if people aren't... And I think that's more of a group thing than one, one person. If if people aren't sh shouting for a PC, then le less will happen, that's for sure. So mm -hmm. for instance, I, I do some work with the Ichthyosis Support Group. I'm chair of their medical advisory board, as well as my involvement with PC Project. But I told Mandy, who works with the Ichthyosis Support Group, who's a patient, to get involved with a Beacon for Rare Diseases, because I could see that they seem to play a big part in advocating in the in the UK for um you know patients with rare rare disorders and they seem to sit on a lot of policy committees and all this sort of thing. So Jan, you need need to find somebody in in, in the UK to join up Beacon for Rare Disorders or Rare Disorders for Beacon or whatever it's called. But anyway, I, I think that's important. Okay, all you UK patients out there, are you listening? Yeah, we're listening. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, good. Pierre, Dave, do you have any call? Either I keep, I should just call on one or the other. Pierre, do you have comments? Uh, I just want to say that the PC project is uh, is a really wonderful endeavor. 
I've been sort of associated with it since it was born. I think it's going to it's celebrating its 20th anniversary this year or last year. Um, and it's just the, the power of of having access. Like I'm I'm a PhD researcher. I'm not a physician. So I don't treat patients. But for a person like me and my colleagues to have access to people who really know best the disease, which is the people who who have it, um, and to meet on a regular basis uh, as researchers, as physicians, as organizers like Jan, and and especially the patient is so powerful. And so you're the real heroes here, I think. Um, and um, and uh, so just uh, spread the news about PC and then PC turns around and engages funding agencies, drug companies and so forth. And plow, plow, we plow flow forward or, or we try. Thank you. Dave, do you wanna make any comments? Well, the only comment was that uh, money drives research. <laughs> Oh. So PC is a, is a fundraising uh, portion of that. And, and there's no question but what contributions and so forth are, are very helpful. We always look for grants. We look for other opportunities to raise money. Uh, the people at PC are not paid. They're a, they're a volunteer type of thing. And so the money goes into PC, goes directly to research to try and benefit uh, patients who have the condition. So that's just something to keep in mind. That's so nice. Thank you. And I should note that Joyce has to go to clinic. So that's why she's dropping off. And it's okay, Joyce. She's got to go be a doctor here on Saturday. So no problem. And um, I just so you know, I did not put Dave or Pierre or any of these people up for saying that. But since we're, we're as we close, I just wanted to tell everybody, thank you for the tremendous support that you give us. You know, somebody donated to us just last month and she said to me, she goes, oh, it's I said, thank you so much. And she said, it's just a little bit. But then she said, well, a, 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 bu a, a bunch of raindrops make a puddle. And I wrote her back. I thought that was really sweet, but I wrote her back and I said, that is true. But in the case of PC, a few raindrops make an ocean. And, and I just cannot even tell you every time someone donates $10. I am just so overcome with gratitude that you do that. And because it adds up. And just like I said, we we funded some amazing research projects. You know, these, these activities where we're going to get these scientists together, it costs money. We may work for free, but realistically, that's not the way the world works. People cannot work for free. And it, it's true. I see rare diseases and they're out there, they're sharing the word and they're getting a lot of traction because they're out there spreading the word. So I promise this was not a plan ask for funding. I just want to say thank you. One other thing I wanted to let you know is there are some people that have donated anonymously. Whoever you are, if you are one of those, thank you that just know I'm hearing it, I'm seeing it. We also... There's companies out there that just want to be charitable. And so we have actually had people who work for companies that give out donations for charities advocate for PC. And, and maybe it's not huge, maybe, but it's huge for us. I mean, we might get $500. We recently got $500 from some company because one of their employees advocated for us. And so just keep that in mind. If you work for a company that does something charitable, hey, we're doing what we do good. And, you know, you know, Adele talked earlier about, you know, the fact that there are diseases that cause deaths and we don't die from PC. But I've thought a lot about that because I hate putting myself out there. I hate talking about the fact that I have PC. I really do. I get it. And yet I think we, someone has a problem in our, their lives and we don't just say, oh, that's too bad. Too bad. So sad. We don't work that way. We say, hey. How can I help you? And so we may not die from PC, except some of us do. Some of, we do have, I better, I'm watching Caitlin, who's really Eliza. She would, she would correct me because we do have patients, babies who have died from um, the, what do you call it? The thickening in the throat. So that is a problem. And we watch out for that. And we know more about that. So we're all over those little babies that have problem and young children who have problems breathing. So I got to be careful that way. But I guess what I'm saying is we're not, we're not like cancer or something like that, but we still say we are going to do the best in our sphere of influence. We can't change the whole skin disease world, but our world is PC. And so by golly, we're going to do our best to keep working in this 
space and do our best because I'm not, I, you know, I'm seeing some of the comments. I'm 61. Will there ever be a cure? My mom wants to know. I want you guys who are getting up there. I am very aware of that. We have patients in our nine, their 90s, and I can't stand the fact that we don't have an approved treatment for them yet. And so just please know that we are aware of that. Do we have hope? Yes. But there's no way we would be doing this if we didn't have hope. And so just wanted to tell you all, thank you. Your your advocacy, your, your speaking up. And since, okay, I always have one more thing to say. I just want to say there was a person, I, I don't even know if she's on the call. She translated one of our brochures into Spanish, just sent it to us this week. Hallelujah. We have another one that's that translated one into Dutch. So if you speak a different language and you're on this call, then you want to help us with translations. Let us know. I'm just saying we have a fabulous community that speaks up, that donates, that helps. We're getting there. So, okay. I always just have plenty to say at the end, but that's it. I want to give a huge thank you to our experts. I know we've got them on a Saturday and, um, I just can't tell you guys enough. Thank you. Joyce Tang, Adele O'Toole, Pierre Cologne, Dave Hansen, the time, the sacrifice, the energy, the love that you give to our community. I just wish you guys could all give them a big heart and a good hand and tell them thank you so, so. But yeah, right. Thank you, Graham. Thank you, some of you that are on here. I'm looking at Alan Bentley there. He's got thank all you. the stand. He's part of us. If you're part of us and you have a painful PPK, we take you, whether you have PC or not, we don't care. Your feet hurt. So we're, we'll take you. Okay. With that, have a happy Saturday. Keep, keep check on the website and other notes and we'll just see you soon. I bye love bye. you all. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. So Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.